Hello and welcome to Cambridge Geopolitics Conversations and this series on the geopolitics of finance. I'm Hugo Bromley. The aim of these podcasts is to answer a simple question. How can countries protect their geopolitical interests in global financial markets? How can states keep pace with innovations in financial markets and currency? How can they act to prevent excessive speculation that could cause huge geopolitical damage and position themselves to succeed in a global economy? In this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Giancarlo. Chris was first appointed as a commissioner of the US Commodity Futures Trading Commission in 2014 and served as its chairman between 2017 and 2019. He is now senior counsel at law firm Wilkie Farr and Gallagher and a director of the Digital Dollar Project. Chris and I are going to be talking primarily about central bank digital currencies. We will discuss why countries are looking at new digital forms of currency and where the risks and opportunities lie, as well as approaches to regulation more broadly. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Really pleased to be here. Thank you for asking me, Hugo. We'll dig into the weeds a bit over time. But first of all, simply put, what is the benefit to the United States of embracing a digital dollar? What's the simple case to be made? Modernization. That's the simple case. Uh, we're, we're moving from an analog world, an analog uh, economy, an analog society into a, a digital society, into a digital economy. We're, we're moving from the first phase of the Internet, the Internet of Information, to a later phase, the Internet of Value, where things of value are increasingly going to be digitized, tokenized, programmable, and, and decentralized, able to be moved from person to person directly without Uh, a tremendous amount of intermediation. And that change is happening in all areas of economic life, from the ability to move a a photograph around the world in an instant to the ability to move things of value. And yet, money still remains in in very many ways uh, an analog instrument um, uh, and not subject to, you know, you, you can move a photograph in a nanosecond to somebody on the other side of the world, but it takes days, if not weeks, to move money around. In fact, there's a joke here in the United States. If you need to get um, uh, $50,000 to Tokyo, the fastest way to do it is stuff it in a suitcase and get on an airplane. And that's just not a, uh, it's just not going to work as we go into this new digital age. And and we're already seeing countries around the world, probably 80 to 90% of the world's central banks, actively exploring the form of digital money and the form of central bank digital currency. So just to continue on this very basic point, I might say I've got a bank account and we're in the UK, we've got contactless everywhere. I can transfer money quickly. The benefit you're talking about is a a benefit of cash and and of moving hard currency around in a digital age. How do we make sure, and this is sort of moving towards privacy really, how do we make sure that cash retains what makes cash great as it as we move towards a digital dollar or a, or a central backed digital currency? So, you know, those contactless payment mechanisms that you talk about, where you, you go into a shop and you, you tap your mobile device, that's still pretty old technology. It may seem instantaneous, but banks, that's really just a series of messages instructing intermediaries, banks somewhere to go through a, actually a pretty old process of verifying the transactors, the parties to the transaction, their identity, their bank accounts, that there's sufficient funds in the account, that funds have moved to the other account. It may seem instantaneous to the to the person in the shop, but in fact, it's still an account-based transaction. No money is really being moved from that mobile device to that reader. It's just a series of accounts transactions in banks somewhere. But with a central bank digital currency, we're talking about that contactless transaction in the shop to really move money, digital money, from the phone to the shopkeeper instantaneously. The shopkeeper is not waiting for the bank to credit that money. It's there immediately. And that's going to have a dramatic impact on on retail transactions, on the ability for shopkeepers to realize uh, returns instantaneously. It's going to have an, an impact on cash flow and, and their operations. It's it's a wholesale step forward architecturally and, and, and transactionally. In fact, what it is, is digital fiat. You know, with a fiat transaction, you don't need somebody to verify your information. You go into a shop and your bank doesn't have to tell the shopkeeper's bank who you are and vice versa. 
when you tran when you hand a, a pound sterling note a coin across the counter or a, or a dollar bill all the sh all the other person needs to do is verify that instrument that's one of the biggest difference here it's about verifying the authenticity of the instrument as opposed to the identity of the transacting parties and this is what you're advocating through the digital dollar project is a is a move for the US to issue a central bank digital currency well Let's let's take it more broadly before I, I get specifically okay. to the U.S. As I mentioned, 80 to 90 percent of the world's major central banks are examining this right now. And there's a number of reasons. I identify really six reasons why this happened. The first the first one, the most form, uh, foremost reason is that governments like China were very concerned about all that financial information being captured by non-state actors, by private actors. In fact, quite frankly, in the West and certainly in the United States, the same concern was raised by our public officials when Facebook, through its project Libra, proposed creation of digital money. And a big part of the concern, and this is a concern today, is about people's financial privacy being uh, in the hands of private non-government actors. The second driving factor is just core infrastructure. You know, uh, states like Singapore that are, are major wholesale financial centers constantly look to modernize their infrastructure. And the amount of friction and cost that's involved in the current accounts based bank money system can be dramatically re reduced by by digital money. And so nations like Singapore are looking at this for the infrastructure improvement. And then thirdly, there's the issue of financial inclusion concerns about have been raised about this by social reformers for years, but we really saw this truly come into place through the COVID epidemic. And a number of nation states like Bahamas, for example, are exploring something they call their sand dollar because they're aware they have populations in outlying areas that are uh, well equipped with mobile and smartphones, but are, don't have access to banks easily, either bank branches or otherwise. And so they see digital money as a way of increasing financial inclusion. And that's something that is increasingly of concern here in the United States. And then a fourth factor that I'd point to is monetary policy, surgical, surgical precision in monetary policy. Um, and certainly we saw this in the COVID-19 response um, by the U.S. government, where it sought to uh, make up for the downturn in the economy by getting money into the hands of people most affected. And yet its means for doing it was based upon issuing paper checks, some of which went to people without bank facilities and others went to people that were frankly dead. And the, the lack of precision in monetary policy in an analog system uh, is, was really identified by that. And so the opportunity for financial precision and monetary policy is another one. And then it get then I get to the point that you mentioned, and that is really uh, geopolitical influence. Certainly, China sees this as an opportunity for greater geopolitical influence to strengthen the yuan and also make it a preferred currency, if not globally, certainly through their client states and their Belt and, and Road Initiative and elsewhere. And then lastly, I would say, and and, the, and this gets to the point you asked, why do I think the United States needs to be engaged in this? And that comes down to core societal values. At the end of the day, money is as much a social construct as it is a, a economic and government construct. Money carries societal values. I think one of the attributes of, of 100 years ago of the, the use of the pound as a reserve currency increasingly in the post-war era as the dollar is the primary reserve currency, were the societal values it carried with it, uh, societal values of individual rights, uh, rights of privacy versus state rights to law enforcement surveillance, and rights of free speech and free enterprise and independent capital markets. We have to, we have to make sure those societal values carry on into, into a digital future. And quite frankly, um, other countries that are developing digital currency have different societal values, societal values of state surveillance of economic activity, of social credit systems and currency controls, and, and, and a lack of a rule of law, or at least to the same extent that we've come to expect in Western democracies. And so the reason why I firmly believe the United States needs to become more active is because, and, and, and Western countries generally, democracies generally, 
is because I think it's important to, to the world, not just to Western societies, to the world, to have money that carries aspirational values of the rule of law, of, of individual rights to financial privacy, balanced, of course, against legitimate state needs for law enforcement purposes, but also free speech and free enterprise and free capital markets. This brings us very neatly to this question of privacy and the balance between law enforcement and fundamental rights to privacy, and which is one of the benefits of cash. It's why it, we have complete control of it. But if you do go to a central bank digital currency, in theory, if you structure it right, you are looking at a treasure trove of information on the economy, on how it works. You can see every transaction. Now, you can use that for purposes of control and enforcement. Um, that may be why China's pushing in this direction. But you can also use it to think about the economy. You can use it to plan policy in a way that is more effective. It's essentially a, a, a theorist's treasure trove. Do you think it's going to be difficult to convince nations as we move to, in this direction not to open that treasure box and to maintain the privacy of digital currency? Uh, Hugo, that is the question. That, that, that is the most important question. So let's, let's kind of level set for a second. First of all, even before we get to digital money, financial privacy is not absolute in our current systems today, whether that's accounts-based money or cash-based fiat money. Uh, in the United States, cash transactions with a, fi a financial institution greater than $10,000 need to be reported to the government. Uh, so there, there is no, there, there, society has come to expect a level of financial privacy in smaller transactions and a, uh, a sacrifice of some of that financial pr tr uh, privacy for larger transactions for the best interest of law enforcement. And so in democracies, we recognize that there needs to be a balance here. And getting the balance right is something we have to do every day. Now, as we move to a digital world, you're absolutely right. The technology presents interesting challenges and opportunities. The neat thing about blockchain-based uh, systems is they're pseudonymous. Uh, that means that the identity of the party to their human identity isn't necessarily linked, but there is uh, the ability to record immutable tra transactions in an immutable way to a ledger. So that presents the opportunity for a government that issues a digital currency to ultimately unmask people, but, but it also presents an opportunity to pseudonymously um, do big data analysis of cash flows without necessarily unmasking the individuals to the transaction. And so what we advocate at the Digital Dollar Project is reestablishing this fundamental balance as we move into this era. And the country that gets that right will have, if you'll excuse the phrase, the killer app, the, the digital currency that properly protects financial privacy and, and yet allows for legitimate law enforcement purposes will, will have a winning card to play. And the country that uses a digital currency for surveillance will have a losing card to play, I believe, in a pluralistic modern world. And one of the reasons why I'm so concerned and have devoted a lot of my professional work these days to seeing the U.S. advance its work is so that we get that balance right. I think that's been enshrined in the dollar in its past several decades as a reserve currency. And I think if we get that right, it could underpin the dollar as a reserve currency uh, for years to come, along with the euro and the pound and other currencies that also take on a digital form and yet get this balance right. Mm -hmm. Most people listening to this will have first heard of digital currencies through blockchain and through traditional cryptocurrencies, which have an association, rightly or wrongly, with criminal behavior and with hiding transactions and hiding money. I, I, I suppose this question comes in two parts. Firstly, how do you persuade people and how do you break that association in people's minds with digital currency and, shall we say, less pleasant areas of the economy? But also, how do you ensure that what one might call the geopolitical benefits of having a reserve currency carry through and will they carry through into this new age of digital currency? I thought when I was thinking about this topic to speak with you, I thought immediately of sanctions and sanctions control, which is a huge thing that the, that the position of the dollar allows through SWIFT or through, or through whatever. 
Can you maintain that kind of action in a digital world, do you think? And how do we persuade people that a digital world is safe? Let's take on the first part of that. You know, um, one of the um, silver linings in the COVID lockdown is that I've been catching up on a lot of movie watching. And uh, about four months ago, I started making a list of how many crime dramas the payoff is in hard cash, usually dollar bills stuffed in a suitcase, <laughs> and how much, how many of them are in cryptocurrency. And, and it's running about 50 to one right now. Uh, and, and, and I saw some figures the other day, and, and probably 50 to one is about right in the amount of illicit behavior that takes place in cash as compared to crypto. Even today, with Silk Road and other notorious crypto uh, illicit uses. Uh, so, so if the dollar can serve its role as, as a reserve currency today, and yet all, there is all that illicit finance, it can, you cannot then say that, well, because there's illicit finance in, 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 in crypto assets, they can't serve a legitimate purpose. You know, life, I, I ran a, a regulatory agency and one of our primary missions was to put bad guys in jail for violating securities laws and other market-based financial activity. There will always be bad guys and gals uh, looking for ways to game the system. That cannot be a reason not to modernize the system. And, and the beauty of digital systems is just as they'll provide greater precision in good activities like extension of monetary policy or financial benefits, um, they will also provide law enforcement with really good tools to go after the bad guys. Now, the bad guys will, as they always do, evolve themselves. You know, the past was a game of cops and robbers. The future will be a game of cops and robbers. That's just the nature of human life. We can't not modernize because we're afraid you know, of a future of criminal activity. We've got to modernize in order to keep pace with the future of criminal activity. Now, um, uh, uh, so, well, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking there. So you, there was a second part to that and I blanked on it. It was a good one. Like, no, no, worries. The, the second part I think was on, <laughs> the second part I think was on sanctions. And oh, sanctions on... Part, of course. Yeah. So, so look, I, I'm not going to uh, either be a, 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 a give an apologia or be a critic of the use of sanctions power or its overuse. Many people uh, believe that it's been abused by the United States. And, and some of that is probably rightful criticism. Some of that is political criticism. It, depending on your view of the person in the White House, sometimes it, you know, they're either overusing it or underusing it. The issue is that used properly, it can be a tool short of other tools that are more dangerous, like warfare. I mean, in, in its proper light, uh, sanctions power avoids having to fire missiles if a country, whether that's the United States or any other country, sees something that they wish to stem in uh, the global environment. A, a world primarily based on one reserve currency and a bank and a, an accounts-based system dominated by the Western power has been very conducive to the use of sanctions power. The fact of the matter is, countries that don't have that dominance but have very strong quickly growing economies like China have not enjoyed that same power and seek to uh, move away from it. There's no question that the development of the DECP, China's central bank digital currency, allowing for direct payments directly to the People's Bank of China, bypassing the traditional banking system, which has been dominated by the Western banks, is going to give them the power to bypass sanctions authority in cases where it's operable. Um, and there's not much that can be done about that, the technology will offer them that opportunity and the Belt Road Initiative will, in a sense, establish that. All the more reason, however, why we want to modernize the dollar, the euro, the pound into a digital format so that they remain instruments of global commerce, so they remain instruments of global aspiration. You know, there's a lot of people in the developing world that in the last 30 years have entered the middle class with the better health outcomes, the better educational opportunities, the better uh, equity between the sexes and, and aspirations for, for growth that have come with that. And I don't think they're going to look to necessarily give that up just for the convenience of a digital currency, for a digital currency that provides state surveillance 
and, and, and social oppression. And so we need to modernize our Western currencies into a digital future so that people around the world can continue to use them and, and, and with the values that are associated with them of financial privacy and free market economics and, and free entrepreneurship. And so um, I, while I'm concerned about China's development, and, and by the way, I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to be a critic of China. It, it has every right and, and every privilege to modernize its currency. It's just that we need to do the same. And if we get the right values involved in it, the world will work out its preferences. I want to return to the the point you raised about regulators in a moment. But just first, to go back to something you talked about much earlier in this podcast about Facebook and their attempt to go around, down this path. Do you worry about stable coins coming out of commercial actors? Do you think they pose a risk either economically or even geopolitically? So I, I began this conversation by saying, you know, we're going from the first phase of the internet, the informat- internet of information, to the internet of value. And in this internet of value, forward-leaning thinkers are exploring what does decentralization, tokenization, digitization, distributed ledger technology mean for things of value. And they've gotten way at, out ahead of governments in exploring it. I also mentioned earlier my belief that money is much more than a government construct. It's a social construct. You know, long before there were governments, people were using shells and beads as a medium of exchange. And so so the private sector has jumped at 10 years ahead of the official sector in exploring the digitization of money. And you know what? That's a good thing because the central banks, as they more slowly move forward to think about modernizing their own monetary instruments can benefit from the advance work that's been done. I mean, it was not, with great respect to my friends that are central bankers, it was not a central banker who wrote the uh, the, uh, Bitcoin manifesto. It it was Satoshi Nakamoto, who who we don't know who he or she is, but my guess is it wasn't a central banker. And the work that's been done, the mining that's been done, that's all private sector activity and the development of Ether and the development of Paxos and Litecoin and, and all of that work is, is private sector driven work. And the official sector is catching up. And I think that's a good thing. I, you, know, you, know, my, you know, in the United States, the development of the early Internet was a, was a relationship between the official sector and the private sector. You know, the space program was a relationship between the official sector and the private sector. I firmly believe that the best innovation comes from the private sector and the official sector working together. And interestingly, China views it that way as well, because they're certainly piggybacking on a lot of the work that was done in the, in the private sector as well. I, I'm really glad you've raised this issue of keeping pace, because that's where I want to, to move to for the final discussions that we're having. And this question of regulation, you led an agency with a, with, a, with a huge amount of interest in this area, but it was one of an awful lot of agencies with interest. And we've seen this, as you say, with the, with the emergence of the internet, with regulators gaining new responsibilities that maybe nobody, when they were founded, envisioned that they would have. How can government regulation keep pace with private innovation in an area like this, where it's constantly changing and constantly evolving? We saw at the end of the Trump administration, action by the Federal Crimes Enforcement Network to bring in some fairly hefty measures on e-wallets and on digital currency. Those have now been paused. But how do we, how do regulators maintain pace in a way that is effective and in a way that ensures that they can act in their own best interest? So there's sort of uh, two approaches to that. I think there's this sort of continental European approach that says that uh, the state and regulators should lay down a regulatory framework, and then innovators should innovate to that framework. And then there's, I think, the more traditionally American approach that the private sector actually gets way out in front of the regulators and the regulators lag behind and play catch up. You know, I, I, I sort of painted those, you know, dramatically, diametrically apart on either end of a continuum. I've done that deliberately because what I want to say is if I had a choice between the two, I'd actually take the latter. And I would take it for the reason that Winston Churchill described democracy as not the best system, but just better than all the rest. The problem with laying down a regulatory framework and telling innovation and and saying, "Okay, innovators, go ahead, is then innovators then innovate to that regulatory framework. 
it's not necessarily what the customer needs. It's not necessarily what society demands, but it's what the state demands. I much prefer a system where innovators innovate to what society needs. Innovators innovate to what customers need, to where there's demand, and then regulators have to follow behind. Now, it's it's it, sometimes it can be messy, sometimes it can be slow, but it, it's the better way because ultimately what comes out of that is first something that met demand and then gets conditioned by broader societal interests and public policies to meet regulatory requirements. So in the case of the CFTC, Bitcoin came about at, a, at the end of the last financial crisis and, and it grew and it grew. And by 2017, uh, when I took over as chairman of the agency, we saw one of the first that what they call uh, Bitcoin Rally 1.0, the first rally in Bitcoin where it reached $20,000. And um, we were approached by two of our exchanges about launching Bitcoin futures products. And, uh, you know, as a regulator, it's not my job to say what's the right price, but it's my job to make sure the market can establish the right price. And the right price can be only established when you've got a two-way market. That is not only the opportunity to buy in order to see it go up, but also actually to basically take an opposing view that it's going to go down through use of futures products. Once you had a two-way market, a regulated two-way market, then institutional money can come in. And so I really believe that the launch of Bitcoin futures, by the way, in the face of real pressure from the international community not to allow the launch of futures, because the international community saw it as legitimizing Bitcoin. In fact, a number of key regulators in Europe were ringing me on the phone saying, please don't do this. But I saw it in a different way. And that is the creation of a two-way market would allow the marketplace and not unelected government appointees, but the marketplace to determine the true value of Bitcoin. And it's better that the marketplace do it. So a market-based approach, I believe, is the right approach. A, a regulatory following approach, as opposed to leading approach, I think is the right place. But you use the phrase keep pace. Even in a regulatory following approach, you can't fall too far behind. Regulators need to stay not a step ahead, perhaps not even a step apace, but perhaps a step behind or two steps behind, not five steps behind. Thank you so much. Um, I must say your description of two potential paths is very interesting to me as a Brit after Brexit. Um, that rather <laughs> that, that, that gives us some things to think about, I'm sure. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me my, today. I suppose as a final thought, what would you like the timeline to be as we move towards digital currencies? And what do you think the timeline will be? If you had to take a guess. I, I think this decade is going to be the decade of increasing development of central bank digital currencies. Uh, in fact, even to shorten the timeline, I think uh, next winter, I, I'm looking, I'm in, in just outside of New York City and I'm looking out my window where it's snowing. Uh, uh, next year, when we arrive in Beijing for the Winter Olympics, the world, I think, is going to be shocked the degree to which the digital yuan becomes ubiquitous for all activities of people there. And I think that's going to be a bit of a Sputnik moment for the West. And I, and I think it's going you're going to see greater acceleration of efforts to develop central bank digital currencies here in the United States, in, in Britain, in, in the continent in response to that. It is the future direction of money. H how can we think that we, we expect an MP3 file to be sent from London, arrive in, Hing in Hong Kong within seconds, and yet still that money will take days, if not weeks, to arrive. There's a generation coming about that expects that same instantaneousness, uh, the same directness, the same peer-to-peer -peer transfer in things of value that they have today in forms of art and forms of, of music and, and images. And so um, uh, this is happening, this is coming, and you know, central banks are going to be are not a pace of it, but they're not going to be five steps behind. It's only going to be two or three steps behind, and it's happening, and it's going to happen in in this decade. Chris, thank you so much. That was really terrific, and I've learned a lot. So um, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to this podcast from Cambridge Geopolitics Conversations. You can find the Centre for Geopolitics on Twitter at Cam Geopolitics. All of our events are advertised on our website at cfg.polis.cam.ac.uk. 